Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, evening's function. This is being organized in association with the Forum of Free Enterprise and the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the members of these organizations and particularly to the, my co-trustee and president of the forum, Homi Ranina, and to the president of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, Mr. Manish Sampat. Today is a day of remembrance. As we remember Nani, on his birth sentence. Each one of us will remember him in his or her individual way because he touched the lives of so many persons in so many different ways. But all of us will remember him for the way in which he inspired and motivated a whole generation and the way in which he sought to protect our rights. We remember Nani for his writings and his speeches, and particularly for his budget speeches at the Brebon Stadium, where he enthralled each year an audience of over 100,000 persons. We remember him for his intellectual brilliance, for his wit, for the profundity of his thoughts and the felicity of his language. We remember him for his courage when he spoke out loud and clear against any injustice to his fellow men. And we remember him for his battles in the Supreme Court when he fought valiantly to protect the basic structure of our Constitution. But even as we remember Nani, we need to remember what a Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court has said about the essential features of a democracy. Speaking on the occasion of the 150th anniversary on 4th July 1939 of the first Congress of the United States, Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes said, and I quote, we not only praise individual liberty, but our constitutional system has the unique distinction of ensuring it. Our guarantee of free trials, of due protection of life, liberty and property, which stands between the citizen and arbitrary powers of religious freedom, of free speech, <coughs> Free press and free assembly are the safeguards which have been erected against the abuses threatened by gusts of passion and prejudice, which in misguided zeal would destroy the basic interests of democracy. <coughs> we miss Nani and never more than at present. To review our memories of Nani, we will now screen again the film on Nali produced by the Trust. Enjoy the film. <coughs> We now come to the main business of this function, will it be the release of the festive in honor of Nani Palkiwala and the 17th Nani Palkiwala Memorial Lecture to be delivered by Mr. Chandrasekharan, Chairman Tata Sons Private Limited. Over the years, the Nani Palkiwala Trust 
has sponsored three books, each different in its own way, namely the Nani Palkiwala, a life, a biography authored by the late M. V. Samad, Nani Palkiwala, the Court of Genius, a collection of the important cases against thoughts argued by him, authored by Sovi Swarajji and Arvindata, <coughs> and the wit and wisdom of Nani Palkiwala, a collection of selected quotations from his writings and speeches, compiled by Jignesh Shah. To this we now add a fourth, a fresh trip, Essays and Reminences, edited by Arvind Dutta. A fresh trip, as you know, is a collection of writings to, or in honor of a scholar, published by his colleagues and his contemporaries, mainly during his lifetime. The, this fresh trip, though slightly different, has the same object. It contains a collection of essays contributed by persons who admired Nani, specially written in his honor, on subjects to which Nani, on which Nani wrote and spoke during his lifetime. It also contains the evidences of some of the persons who knew Nani intimately. Hence its title, Essays and Reminences. We are greatly indebted to all those who have so readily responded to our invitation to contribute to this festival and some of whom are present here today. I must also express our gratitude to Justice Sujata Manohar and Justice Sam Bariyawa, who as members of the advisory panel devoted so much time and effort at several meetings of the panel and for their valuable guidance and encouragement at all times. Our deepest gratitude, however, must be reserved for Mr. Arvind Dutta. He almost single-handedly shouldered the burden, assisted by his associates, of editing the contributions, identifying the photographs, selecting Nani's articles and letters, interacting with the publisher, and generally performing all the tasks which were necessary for this publication. To this task, he has devoted at considerable cost to his voluminous practice an incredible amount of time and effort, including a whole day spent in the Tata archives in Pune. To him, this has been a labor of love, and we are truly grateful. Before I request Abhin Dutta to hand over the first copy of the book to Mr. Chandrasekharan for release and thereafter to speak to us about the book, I would request my co-trustee, Sherin Barucha, to offer flowers and a memento to Mr. Chandrasekharan. And a pause and a memento to Arvind Dutta. I will also request Swati Kapadia to offer flowers to Mrs. Chandrasekharan, who has honored us by her presence with us today. And flowers and mementos to Justice Sujata Manohar and Justice Kalmanya.
request that Ms. Dattar to hand over the first copy of the book to Mr. Chandresh Chandrasekharan for release and thereafter to speak to us about the book. Chandrasekhar, Sri Deepak Parekh, Sri Vaish Maligam, Sri Barucha, distinguished members of the audience. I must thank all of you for being present here on this historic and momentous occasion. I must particularly thank quite a few persons who have come here only for this function from Chennai, Bangalore, De Delhi and Pune. Some of them are going back at midnight today. Last June, the Nani Palkala Memorial Trust constituted an advisory panel and we decided to publish a book to commemorate his birth century. I was privileged to work with an advisory panel consisting of Justice Sujata Manohar, before whom I did my first important case in the Supreme Court. Fortunately, I won. <laughs> and before Justice Sam Mariava, H.P. Ranina, Mr. Malegam, and myself. We had a number of meetings in Bombay and slowly the book took shape. We decided that we, will, we would avoid publishing anything which is already in the public domain, avoid it being too legal and too technical. And therefore we decided to publish a fresh shift consisting of articles on law, taxation law, constitutional law, media law, economics, governance and the social media. This book ultimately turned out to be 500 pages. What was planned as a 100 page small book turned out to be a fat book of 500 pages. It was also decided by the advisory board that today we would release another book, which was the 11th edition of Kangan Pachyola's Law of Income Tax. You saw in the picture the first edition, which was published in 1950 at a price of 35 rupees. And it was decided that we would publish the 11th edition, which is the 70th year of the book. Unfortunately, the budget has been announced on 31st January or 1st February, and the publishers were reluctant to bring out the book 11 days before the budget. They would prefer the budget, the book to come immediately after the finance bill is approved by the president. So hopefully that book should be released in April. In the end, this special alone came to be published. Now, the question which I have been often asked by everyone is, what is the meaning of Feshkraft? And this word is of a German origin. It, the Fest means to celebrate, celebration, and Schrift means writing. And the Oxford Dictionary, as Mr. Malagam says, calls it a collection of writings in honor of a scholar. And we have had a Feshkraft in memory of Sir William Wade, a very remarkable Feshkraft in, uh, to, con to honor Lord Hoffman, who is fortunately still with us. And so we decided that we have a fresh book in memory of Nani Pankeva. <laughs> now, this book consists of four parts. I'll just briefly tell you about the book. Unfortunately, the laws in Maharashtra don't permit the sale of this book uh, at the auditorium. I would have preferred if you could sell some copies to people who had come here. But this book consists of four parts. The first part are the essays, which are written by eminent people. There are 20, 20, about 15 essays, some of which are almost as detailed as a research paper. And they cover a wide range of topics, including economics, governance, and so on. Now, the second part of the book consists of reminiscences and recollections. Parkyal, as you know, would have been 100 if you were right. Almost all his contemporaries are no more. 
But we had a number of people who had the opportunity of working with him, being his close relatives and so on. And we requested a number of them to write their recollections and remembrances. And the second part is a delightful collection of various letters and pieces and small small snippets that give a fascinating insight into the life of this man. <coughs> now the third and fourth part are very interesting. While we were preparing the book, I got a call from Mr. Divakara from Bangalore. Divakara, as you know, he was the Director General of the Forum and he along with Mr. M. R. Pai were very closely working with Mr. Parthiva. In fact, M. R. Pai once told me that Apart from Nargesh, he spent the maximum number of time with Nani Pandyavala. So <laughs> that is the amount of time, they how close they were. So Devakara called me from Bangalore and said that Arvind, I have got Satira Ranina has sent me a box of newspaper articles written by Pandyavala. And these are published in, from 1937 to 1945. Wow. So I told him, sir, why don't you Xerox it and send it to me and I'll have it typed out in Chennai and prepare it. But he said, no, the, the articles are so brittle, the papers are crumbling, I can't possibly do it. Then I said that we'll have only get it typed. And to his credit, Jivakara took the trouble of typing 480 pages of the article. Ah. Now, this voluminous material had to be sifted because we couldn't have volume, we had only one volume and the outer deadline was 400 pages. So we said that we'll have to sift and collect the articles. So, and it was absolutely a treasure trove of material. And it was not separating wheat from chaff, it was separating wheat from wheat. <laughs> and we had, finally we took a call with the help of my advisory panel that we would not publish something which was very topical. Parkhira has written a lot on the events of the day about the Second World War and so on and so forth. So I said these are all matters which have lost interest. Let us publish something which has got more eternal value. And so we chose some articles which were written by him at the age of 37. Those of you who will buy them, I would earnestly request you to read an article called The Signposts of Dickens Land. It is published in 1938. And the Knowledge, the command, the depth of understanding of an 18 year old boy of Charles Dickens is simply unbelievable. I was completely dumbfounded and awestruck by his learning. In 1939, he writes about William Wordsworth. In 1940, he writes about Thomas Hardy. All these articles are in the book, and I hope you enjoy reading them. Now, most of these articles were published in newspapers and periodicals I have not heard of. Except Jame Jamshed, which is still in publication, these articles were published in Prashd Rabhar, Mumbai Vartman, Sun Vartman, Kaiser e Hin, and all these journals. So it was really a remarkable thing to go into all these newspapers and articles and tell out the best of them. Uh, now I come to the fourth part. We decided to publish a collection of his letters and documents. When I worked with Bairam Vartyala and when I wrote the first book, The Courtroom Genius, I remembered he had a few boxes of Vartyala's uh, correspondence. So when I asked Jangir, I said, can I have a copy of those documents? His name is Jangir, you know, we have sent it to the Tata archives in Pune. So with the help of Farooq Subedar and Swati Kapadia, I decided to make a trip to Pune. So I called Mr. Narla, Rajendra Prasad Narla, who was the chief archivist, and I said, I'd like to come to Pune. He said, yes, we work Monday to Friday. I said, I'm in court on Monday to Friday. Can you please work on Saturday? And he was very sweet enough to say, yes, we'll work for on Saturday. So I said, okay, I'll come to Pune, take the morning flight, see the boxes, and I'll take and go back the afternoon. So he politely told me, that Mr. Dada, we have 73 boxes of his correspondence and 1,600 photographs. So I don't think you can do it in a few days. So the next thing I did also be running short of time. So with four other colleagues and six members of Narla's team, we, I was going to start after breakfast but we just started early in the morning and went on for the whole day. And from 73 boxes, we shortlisted what we could in the fourth part. Of course, we are greatly helped by the tremendous and enormous meticulous care with which the records are maintained. All have been indexed in Excel sheets, tagged and so on, so we could easily identify what we wanted. 
We also had spent hours going through 1600 photographs, which all digitized, and chose shortlist this uh, and shortlisted them. One thing I found in those days was I was wondering the number of letters people wrote. I mean, I didn't know whether, how could they have time for anything else. And they were letters written to almost everybody under the sun. Prime ministers, ministers, judges, and they replied and then finally we had to select a few letters. And to those of you interested in details, these 73 are asset-free boxes made by the inmates of Yerawara jail. And all the documents are stored in that. And if you think 73 boxes is staggering, I was told by Marla that J.R.D. Tata's correspondence runs this 93,000 pages. So I don't know who's going to write a book on him, but <laughs> Some of the letters are very touching. I particularly remember a letter he wrote when Solis Ramji's own junior became the attorney general. He starts the letter by saying, my dearest Soli, and after the first paragraph, which is a congratulatory paragraph, he writes a sentence which is very important, I'll read it. He said that the role of the Attorney General is misunderstood. The greatest glory of the Attorney General is not to win cases for the government, but to ensure that justice is done to the people. He then goes on to write in the letter to Soli Sarabji. He says that in the office of the Attorney General of the United States is a plaque which is fixed in the office and that plaque reads, the United States wins its case whenever justice is done to one of its citizens in the courts. So remarkable and so poignant to today. On behalf of the advisory board, I sincerely hope that all of you will enjoy reading the festival. In this very auditorium, in January 2012, we released the book, The Courtroom Genius, which was a journey that chronicled the, all the important cases which Valkyola argued. The mandate given to me and Mr. Sori Surabhi by Mr. Malegam and the trust was that M.B. Kamath would write his life biography about himself as a person and we would take care of writing the life of young Nani, the important cases he argued, and we were told that write a book that would help young lawyers that they could portray Nani as a role model of that particular, for the, for the future generation of lawyers. We had a first print run of 2,000 copies, and I never thought that it would say more than that. It's perhaps a mark of how much Nani particular is remembered even today, and how much of a role model is even today, that on 1st December 2019, this book has entered its 17th reprint. Wow. <laughs> Suli Sarabji, even today, chides me for giving up our royalty on the book. <laughs> but nevertheless, this book has served as a role model, and I hope that this festival will be equally read and appreciated by young and old law by life. And before I conclude, in the film you saw that reference was made to various cases, and I'm glad that they have, because people often say that they keep talking about Kesan Bharati and basic structure. But as a student of law, I felt that his basic contribution was a quartet of cases, but the bank nationalization in 69, the Privy Persons case in 1970, the Kesan Bharati case in 1973, and what is most forgotten, <coughs> the most important contribution according to me, is the minimum men's case. If we believe that Parliament is always acting for the good of the people, it's not true. The 42nd Amendment, which CUI called the most outrageous amendment to the Constitution, provided three things, and this is what I wanted the data audience to remember. How close we were to slipping away into becoming a dictatorship. In the emergency, when all the opposition leaders were in jail, the 42nd Amendment was passed, of course, unanimously, and it contained three provisions. Look at the sinister nature of these provisions. The first provision said that the state legislature or the central legislature, that is parliament or any state in India, can pass any law. And if that law merely contained a declaration, just a declaration, that it was intended to attain the directive principle of state policy, just a declaration, you could not challenge it in any court on any ground, even if that law did not have the remotest connection with the directive principle. The second amendment was that 
parliament would have the power, unlimited power, to alter, amend or repeal any part of the constitution. And the last was that any amendment to the constitution, either before or after 1976, would never be challenged in any court on any ground. Just imagine the consequences of this particular law if it had been survived. Fortunately, this law was struck down. And I will only conclude by saying that all of us say that we can sleep peacefully because we are confident that our borders are protected by armed forces. And I would equally say that we can sleep peacefully with the assurance that our fundamental rights and the basic structure of the constitution will always remain secure because of the efforts of one single man.
Apart from his professional career in the Tata Group, <coughs> Mr. Chandrasekhar also has a number of other important responsibilities. He is a director on the board of the Reserve Bank of India, a member of the International Advisory Council of Singapore's Economic Development Board, a co-chair of the India-US CEO Forum, and an active member of India's bilateral business forums, including USA, UK, Australia, and Japan. The subject which he has selected for <coughs> building India for the future is also very topical. <coughs> After a steady economic growth over several years, India is facing strong headwinds with significant decline in GDP, fresh investments, capital formation, exports, and with growing unemployment. What is needed, therefore, is not knee-jerk reactions, but more long-term strategic plans. And I have no doubt that Mr. Chandrasekhar, with his vast experience, both locally and globally, will provide ideas for some bold and far-reaching solutions for the future. Mr. Chandrasekhar. Mr. Malagam. Deepak Parikh, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It is a great privilege and honor to be asked to deliver the Palkiwala Memorial Lecture. And I thank you for giving this opportunity. And today I am going to share a few thoughts on building India for the future. But before I get on to that, I thought it would be worthwhile to spend a few minutes discussing the contexts in which we are talking about building the future. Everywhere we look, the change is upon us. In every single dimension, that you care to look at, whether it is the technology disruption, sustainability challenges that we need to address, or the geopolitical situation and the protectionism that is growing, or what we call as the future of work, the way people will live, work, and how it is getting redesigned, all of this are bringing about enormous amount of change and at a fast pace that we cannot fathom. The other part I want to highlight is that the countries that are advanced and those which pretty much grow growth will no longer be contributing to the, to the incremental growth. The developing nations are becoming younger, more dynamic, and the growth will come from the developing nations going forward. The share of the elderly people, that is people above 65 years of age, for the first time will cross a billion people out of the 8.5 billion people in the world. On the other hand, for the first time, the number of people globally who are within the working age population is beginning to decline now since 1960. And most of the working age population that will be added will come from low-income economies, primarily from India, Kenya, and Nigeria. In contrast, the upper-income countries, as well as China, 
who have been the traditional engines of growth will see a decline in their absolute working age population for the first time. And if you look at the scenario of the last 10 years post the financial crisis, there are two or three factors that look very, very <coughs> distinctive. <coughs> the capital expenditure used to consistently grow in double digits until the financial crisis. The few years before the financial crisis saw an average growth rate of 13 percent year on year in capital expenditure. But since the financial crisis, it has never taken off. In the last 10 years, the growth has been 0.1 percent. 0.1 percent is the money that's going into capital expenditure globally in incremental growth as opposed to 13 percent before. There are many reasons. There are lots of uh, different reasons given. Collapse of the commodity boom, shortfall in the oil related capital expenditure, etc. To my mind, the most important thing that stands out is the reassessment of China's growth potential. China was growing at a rapid pace and the world believed it will continue, and then at some point in time, that failed was lost and that affected the overall spend towards incremental investment capital expenditure. So we've got to be careful when we talk about India's growth and the confidence that it does to the rest of the world is equally important as it is important to us internally. Finally, one other data point is the productivity. The productivity before the financial crisis used to grow on a year-on-year -year basis 1% for several years. But post the financial crisis, the productivity has dropped, the growth has dropped to 0.1%, 1% to 0.1%, which is a, only 10% of the growth that we used to have. Again, there are a lot of reasons. Aging workforce, slowing global trade, but to me, the most important thing is the growth has shifted from advanced nations to emerging markets. And these markets need labor reforms, and those labor reforms are not happening. And that is definitely affecting the productivity. From an Indian context, we are in our own set of transformations. We kept talking about the demographic dividend, but that it, that it is finally here. We have over 700 million people today of age group below 30, more than twice the size of the entire population of the United States. As we all know, there are million people joining the working age pool every month. Our GDP per capita stands at $2,000 and expected to go close to $5,000 by 2030. We will become the third largest economy, no questions on that, but yet we will not be a rich economy. I remember reading a report called the India Vision 2020 report produced by some expert people and it was published in 2004. The vision as seen in 2004 about 2020 was we will be a nation who will be better educated, healthier, more prosperous than any other point in our history. The report also said the largest number of new jobs will be created by SMEs and unemployment will not be there. So this is the scenario we are painting in 2004 about 2020. But I must admit, today if you ask me the view of 2030, I will say the same thing. 
and I'm very much, there are many people who talk about a vision of India of the future. So the point here is, not that the analysis is wrong. The analysis is correct and the potential is there. We can be a very educated nation, we can be a healthier nation, we can be a very prosperous nation. But somewhere we don't seem to execute. That is something that we got to keep in mind. If we have to come the other side, where we see all of this as a reality, there are a number of things that we need to do. We certainly need to be able to handle more than double the capital flows and exports. And we need to figure out a way of skilling 10 million people every year. And we need to be able to create the infrastructure that is necessary to be able to handle the movement of millions of people from the villages to the urban areas. So to my mind, our ability to get to the other side depends on whether we can carry our people with us. This will only happen when we accept that we as a country are terribly underperforming to the potential that we have. Now coming to the economy, India has slowed down and the growth expectations are being adjusted or have been adjusted downward consistently. If this slowdown feels different, that's because it is different. Usually, when you talk about any one of these, you have one or two reasons behind the weaknesses. But the current weakness has many components. Consumption is a problem, investment is a problem, export is a problem. All of them have slowed a little bit. In the midst of such a prolonged slowdown, everyone looks for more simplistic answers. The question that's asked of you is, can you tell me what are the, what are the one or two things we must do to get the economy back on track? You met the FM, have you given three suggestions? So, we always are looking for some secret sauce. We can switch on some light, some switch, and things will happen. The fact is, to my mind, we are going through some fundamental changes. I believe that we are working through an unwinding of a legacy approach in many dimensions, whether we talk about delivery of public services, whether we talk about corruption, whether we talk about NPS, in every single aspect, we are, in a manner of speaking, or unwinding the way we approached the past, and it takes time. To the government's credit, I would say, we have achieved certain things in terms of reaching households, whether it is electrification or bank accounts or healthcare, insurance or sanitation or even rural connectivity. These are massive social transformation programs. But then you cannot sustain large scale social transformation without economic transformation. And fundamentally, we have to get around to the fact that we need to fix jobs. If we cannot create an environment of job creation, we just cannot do an economic transformation. So to my mind, that is very fundamental if we have to continue with social transformation. There are many suggestions one can give, but I would like to stick to three important areas or ideas in terms of what we need to do to build a future 
where we can realize our potential. The first is unleashing the power of private sector. The second is providing modern <coughs> delivery of public goods and public delivery. I say modern because this needs to be thought through. Third is an idea that I and my colleagues have worked and conceptualized what I call as Brigital. Brigital is basically about bringing technology, removing any halo about te te technology and make it simplistic and put it in the hands of billion people so that it can augment their knowledge, their skill, their ability to do higher levels of work. And there are other things about digital, but I'll come to that in a minute. First, I'll talk about unleashing the power of the private sector. See, we need to convert the private sector environment into a racetrack from an obstacle course. <coughs> Whether you take areas like banking, power, <coughs> real estate sector, I try to avoid talking about immediate future, but some of these things are essential in order to talk about building the future. Or you take services sectors like tourism. While our economy demands a very agile financial system, many of our bank, banks are under stress and not fully functioning. And not fully functioning for almost a number of years. Since the start of this decade, the Indian banking system, or the last decade, the Indian banking system has consistently grappled with the issue of non-performing assets. Primarily due to the excess credit of take of the past. Yes, we have introduced reforms, the IBC, and we have infused some capital into the banking system to clean up their balance sheets. But we need to speed up this process now. The next step to my mind is to address the issue of governance of public sector banks. Certainly reduce their stake in the public sector banks and they become more performance driven. You take power sector, well, we can talk about a lot of reforms. Almost all state electricity distribution companies are under significant financial stress. And if you include the subsidy they give, the loss due to the power distribution companies alone is in excess of 140,000 crores a year. This needs an urgent attention. It's a state subject, but privatizing distribution on a city by city basis can address these problems. Direct benefit transfers can be adopted as a means of giving subsidy rather than the current method. In real estate, the revival of all the stalled housing projects and their completion has to become a top priority. Until then, the sector is not going to take off. And this is just taking too long. Tourism contributes over 9% of India's GDP. And you know, we hardly get about 10 million tourists a year internationally. Even the domestic tourism is very small compared to the potential that we have. Hawaii alone has 14 million tourists. We get 10 million as a nation. Singapore gets 18 million. China gets 60 million. Thailand gets 35 million. So it's a Tremendous opportunity because a sector like that, if it is unleashed, it will not only bring foreign exchange. Tourism today is the third largest foreign exchange in China. But what it will do 
is to completely develop the infrastructure, provide the connectivity links, infrastructure links, and creates humongous amount of jobs, well-paying jobs. So alongside all these sector-specific measures, we need to reimagine our economic and business culture. Culture is most critical. Growth does not necessarily come from pushing hard. There's no point in telling people drive fast, drive fast, drive fast. It will come from by removing obstacles. We see it every day. Take a small and medium enterprise. The number of hurdles that they have to go through is just unbelievable. The number of filings is almost thousand. So all of these things have to be dramatically simplified. Each obstacle is problematic on its own, but together they turn basic economic activities into Herculean tasks. I think we have and lack in our country of making every ordinary task <laughs> an extraordinary task. <laughs> so we've got to figure out how things can happen faster. This requires a lot of transformation. This requires a transformation vision in which we move away from a control culture of micromanagement. I would say we need supervision, we don't need suspicion. And we have suspicion. All our rules start from suspicion. So what happens is the people who do honest work and real work are put through enormous amount of difficulty. Not that the others don't, everybody has to go through the pain. Today, there is enormous focus on risk management through more control, which means more policies and more rules. What this has led to is it has led to an undesirable equilibrium where it is safer to avoid or delay decisions. And in most cases, Refer even the straightforward decisions to the judiciary. <laughs> small, very smart risk management is eminently desirable, but multiplying the number of policies, it is not going to get us there. But the better oversight of the existing rules and policies will get us there without any more new rules. <coughs> In running business, I know, growth always involves risks. You have got to celebrate people who take risks. And people who are action oriented. Whenever people take actions, you have got to recognize, you have got to reward and you have got to protect them. Because every time, if you are going to be saying that you have got to act, but if you fail, I will crucify. Nobody will die. So that is a cultural change we need. <coughs> the second topic I want to talk about is public goods. The second big area where we need to harness all our efforts is the design and delivery of our public goods and services. India can become 5 trillion and 10 trillion economy. But no economy can ever become a 5 or a 10 trillion without an educated, vibrant, skilled workforce. When you look across examples of nations who have achieved very high level of economic development, it comes down to policies that promote very strong public delivery systems. For India, I coined a term called SHINE. It has four aspects of public service delivery. SHINE, sustainability, health, 
inclusion and education. I will speak a little bit about each one of them. So before I talk about what we need to do in each one of them, if you ask me what should success look like 5 years from now, 8 years from now, in the future, if you have to decide a set of matrices, we should say, yes we have arrived, we have achieved our goals. To me it is, we should cut the air pollution by half. We should provide universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water. Third, a very important one, one third of our workforce should be women. Currently, it's less than one third. We should eradicate and eliminate malnutrition completely. And we should move towards a health coverage where a doctor to people ratio at least comes to comes close to a global average of 1 to 1000 and we are 1 to 1700 now but we are concentrated completely in the urban area. Two thirds of the doctors we have live in the urban area and two thirds of our people live in the rural area. So if you do this ratio in rural areas, we only to 4000 or even one is to 5000. Then coming to education, we need a big reform to shift <coughs> from educational attainment or getting degrees or getting certificates to education outcomes. The reimagining of India's education system should be to shift it from its current industrial focus to the one that nurtures the digitally native people we have who are problem solvers and it is based on five core skills. First is digital skills. It's easy to provide digital skills than the basic skills which we were provided when we were young, which is like reading, writing and counting. And providing digital skills is easier than that. And we should be doing that on grand scale. Every kid in the country should get it. Second is what I call as the 21st century skills. Currently we are trying to address 20th century, 21st century problems with 19th century model. We want to move the model to the 21st century model. 21st century creativity, collaboration and problem solving has to be second nature to everyone growing up. Like when we grew up, we tables and all we used to know by heart. We never used to use the calculator. Uh, like that, the 21st century skills should be second nature. The third thing is on-the-job apprenticeships should become in scale. Fourth is entrepreneurial thinking because we want to grow entrepreneurs but we don't give them any skill, we don't teach them. <coughs> all of our entrepreneurs, especially SMEs, are all self-made. We don't have any ecosystem. <coughs> then the fifth one is lifelong learning. <coughs> because the way the world is evolving, people will live longer, people will work longer, and they will need skills. We can't have a situation where when people become 50, 60 or 40, 45, the next generation and then they don't have the skills. Sustainability is another big topic. I will just say one statement. Our growth should be coupled with an increasingly efficient and limited resource footprint. Whether it is water consumed or whether it is energy used or it is the waste that is generated, whether it is water, energy or waste that is generated, mm. it has to be very tightly controlled. On healthcare, our focus should be on primary healthcare. 
if you want to truly realize the potential of Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, it needs to be accompanied by a concerted effort to augment capacity in primary health care. <coughs> Inclusion can mean many things, but here I am being very specific. It is about women. Just look at a couple of statistics. Only under a quarter of women in India engage in paid work. This is one of the lowest among countries, even who have our similar income levels. And the surprising thing is this number is falling. For the entire last decade, this number is falling further. The second, nearly 120 million Indian women, 120 million Indian women have at least a secondary education but do not participate in the workforce. And we talk about it in great detail in the book we launched recently. But this alone can contribute, even if half of these people go to work, will contribute 400 billion to India's GDP. I already talked about education. In education, we need to have dual approaches for our workforce. Education and skills. We are pushing everybody down the education path, not on the skill path. In reality, a lot of people have to be pushed down the skill path. Only a few need to go, not a few, only a portion of the people have to go on the education path, tertiary education, multiple education, and so on. And this, bring to my, this brings me to my final recommendation, which is Bridgeton. See, India is facing a decade in which 90 million people will come into the working age between 2020 to 2030. 90 million people. The same period, if you look at US, Brazil and Indonesia combined, our number is four times of all the three nations combined. So we really need big ideas. We are not going to pull the needle by doing little things here, little things there. To my mind, I think we have a solution. We call it digital. Technology can provide an unprecedented solution if we play our cards right. Thinking digitally is very simple. It is about making technologies like AI and the related skills and tools <coughs> available to everyone. <coughs> so that their skills are significantly augmented and they can, they can perform higher level tasks. Currently what is happening is we have what is called as a missing middle problem. We got experts and then we got low skill or no skill. And the entire missing, the middle is missing. We don't have the skills. So it is not that the low skill or the no skill people rise to the missing skills. It is always the higher skill people wasting their time coming down and we can fix that and it will do two things it will generate a lot of jobs and it will enhance the productivity significantly and it will create many of the jobs which are informal become formal and better paying jobs we estimate that on the whole it will at least give a 15% Increasing wages for low skilled, low skilled workers. We think entrepreneurship can be fixed with digital. We have experienced in Bangalore, which has learned from Silicon Valley, to create entrepreneur startup ecosystems. Every entrepreneur in every cluster needs the same thing. It is access to finance, it's access to taxation help, access to 
human resources, access to um, systems, all of this can be created with a large digital platform, a common platform. We call it a platform of platforms approach. Can effectively replicate this whole supporting ecosystem that we have seen in the IT industry. I think these are the three distinct areas I wanted to highlight. Unleashing the power of the private sector, delivering public goods and services in a modern way, and the third is adoption of technology, the concept called digital. Closing, if you think this technology adoption is daunting, I would like to remind you that it is not out of our reach. The creation of ADA, a giant biometric identity scheme covering billion Indians, linking everything from tax returns to their mobile phones and bank accounts, is a tremendous step forward. And we have arguably one of the best government-backed online payment infrastructure in the world. These are great examples. And we just need to think holistically, think it in every dimension, think on scale. Think in a very transformative way, not take one problem at a time. I would say that I've been a student of the software restitution revolution and I still remember the year I joined TCS, TCS was 27 crores revenue and our capital expenditure that year was importing a mainframe for 40 crores. <laughs> and that was 7 million dollars in the currency at that time. From there, for 500, 600 people to almost direct and indirect jobs of 10 million people, that industry has seen a transformation. But compared to what we can achieve with digital transformation, the software revol revolution looks to me like just skimming the surface. Because here the impact will be on a billion people. To build a new kind of country and take it into the future, <coughs> generally it is assumed that we need a lot of money, large budget, budget and multi-year plans. So what it does is it senses thinking and go down to building more physical infrastructure, hospitals, schools, other buildings and so on. But that is necessary, we should not neglect what we have. To my mind, we already have what it takes to create not only more jobs, but better jobs. We also have the capability to improve and view ourselves not as a low-cost nation, but have the mindset to look at as a talent-rich talent nation. <laughs> that changes the game completely. I think if we design the deployment of technology, taking the talent that we have, we will surprise ourselves and surprise everyone else. But we want to make sure <coughs> that this transition can work across all stakeholders, be it business, the public sector, or a common man. Deliberate action across the rural areas of unleashing the power of private sector, providing modern public goods and services <coughs> and digital, combined with the commitment to the long-term thinking will lead to meaningfully higher standards of living across the country. This is what is needed to bring us that much closer 
to fulfilling the aspirations of new India, which deserves such a quality of life. Thank you for listening. As we conclude the 17th Nani Palkiwala Memorial Lecture, as is tradition, I have been given the task of doing the vote of thanks. For many of us who had the privilege of personally knowing Nani Palkiwala, without doubt, we miss him a lot today, particularly today as it marks his birth centenary. Memories of certain people who have long since left us stay deep within, not because of their status, not because of their achievements, but it is their values, beliefs, righteousness, and their acts of kindness that, have, that leave indelible impressions upon us. This is the legacy that the Board of Trustees of the Nani Palkiwala Memorial Trust hopes to keep alive so that successive generations may try to imbibe some of his doctrines. It is said that times change, circumstances change, but strong values and principles don't. To re-emphasize this, let me read out three single-line quotations of Nani Palkiwala. These were written nearly 50 years ago. The inferences are for you to interpret. But to my mind, it still seems starkly relevant in these present times. These are his telling words and largely pertain to the protection of fundamental rights. One, our constitution is primarily shaped and molded for the common man. Two, the great makers of our constitution clearly intended that the integrity of the constitution should be preserved against any hasty or ill-conceived <coughs> changes. And three, with the growing powers of the government all over the world, it is eminently desirable for any democracy to have fundamental rights which cannot be curtailed or abrogated. And we, while we must hold on to the many learning that Nani has left behind, it is equally important not to get too consumed by pessimism and doom mongering. I am an optimist and from Chandra's speech you know he is an optimist and I am confident about the future of India that our youth will see India's best days. It is for this reason that the trustees picked a fine young leader like Chandra, who clearly is filled with vision, optimism, and compassion. Thank you, Chandra, for agreeing to be with us today. <laughs> Chandra's narrative about building India for the future has been inspiring and insightful. His simple style is very relatable to both the young and the older generation. For a man who is constantly on the go, literally running across the globe, it has been a privilege to have him with us today. Chandra, in, the in his character characteristic style, deconstructs complex issues to offer simpler solutions, as you saw today. While technology is Chandra's DNA, he is a strong pro proponent of not technology for technology's sake, but technology in context applied in ways that make sense to people. And this is also the underlying theme of his latest book, The Digital Nation. He gives us, he gives us hope that the labor market has nothing to fear because of technology. Instead, 
He assures us that India is well poised to embrace mutually beneficial relationships between its people and the new applications of technology. No wonder today he is the shining go-to man of the government as well. And when I mean shining, I don't mean sustainability, healthcare, inclusion, and education. So to particularly all the younger ones in the audience today, I want to tell you that Chandra was an ordinary boy who went on to do extraordinary things. They say many get leadership positions due to the two G's, good luck and godfathers. <laughs> Chandra's ascent had neither. His own brother has said that he wasn't academically brilliant, but he always put his mind and heart into duty. Commitment, loyalty, and hard work remain his trademark. For me, apart from being my friend, Chandra is an outstanding example of a leader with humility, a leader who is a solution seeker, a leader who is a team builder, and a leader who displays a great sense of calmness and confidence no matter what the circumstances are. The only secret that no one has cracked so far about Chandra is what goes on in his mind when he runs each day. <laughs> is he choking out the next strategy of the salt to software group? Or is he in total meditative state of mind? No one really knows and he's not telling anyone either. <laughs> Outside of work, I've always enjoyed his company. On and off, he's called me when he's thirsty and he wants to have a glass of imported beer and binge on Gujarati food. And I must say that he does have a voracious appetite, particularly for Gujarati food. <laughs> So Chandra, look forward to have more of these sessions with you. Lastly, year after year, when we had the Nani Palkiwala Memorial Lectures as trustees, we are overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the help and support that we receive from so many people. There are too many to name individually, but we are very grateful for all your efforts and support. A special thanks, of course, goes to Mr. Kushru Santo. He's here with us. Chairman of the NCPA, who has very kindly provided the Tata Theatre free of cost for today's program. Normally, he is very particular about the finances of NCPA, but at this time, he not charged us anything. He very rarely doesn't charge anyone. So, thank you, Bush. The Bombay Chartered Accountant Society the Forum of Free Enterprises. And on behalf of Arvind Dakar, I would also like to uh, thank Rahul Unikrishnan, his junior, Arvind Arla and his team, and uh, Arjun Bhargava. Of course, the audience who remains our driving force in organizing the memorial lectures each, day, each year. Ladies and gentlemen, we conclude today's program with the National Anthem. May I please request everyone kindly to stand up for the National Anthem. The audio track of the National Anthem is by the Symphony Orchestra of India. Sorry, thank you.